Good morning. My name is Ryan Stevens. I'm a principal consultant at NodeSource. They give me the opportunity to inspire great Node.js development. Throughout my career, I started more in the Java enterprise world. I slowly started migrating and working on front ends through JavaScript, uh, a little more secretly than nowadays. Back then, it wasn't so popular to be in the front end, but I, I enjoyed it. I loved the language. And then slowly, I made it to the kind of the convergence of those two, Node.js. I've both worked in and managed, managed teams. The one single thread that I've, uh, or the two takeaways I've, I've noticed while being in all three teams is people do approach problems differently. They have different mental models. However, as much as they like to admit it or not, there's very common building blocks that are shared across that help each other out when people try to transition from one to the other. So before I get into my talk, I wanted to kind of share a personal story about when I was in high school, I joined the racquetball team. It was a brand new sport, and I didn't know how to do hit the ball or uh, return or anything like that, so I learned it from scratch. So, but, but after a while, I wanted to get, improve my game and get my hit speed up, and so I asked my coach, hey, how do I hit faster? Because you know that was important to me in high school, and I just wanted to hit the ball hard. So he said, the mechanics of a racquetball swing are much like the mechanics of a baseball bat swing. And then he went away, he had something to do. So I thought that was interesting. I played baseball earlier on in life. I kind of understood the mechanics of it. So I tried to do that. And lo and behold, I was able to hit the ball much, much harder. And that, that excited me. The only problem was I lost accuracy. Eh, you know, you're in high school. It didn't really matter. I was hitting the ball hard. Unfortunately, I lost every single game for a couple weeks match for a couple weeks. Uh, so when I asked my coach finally, you know, what, what am I doing wrong? You gave me this great advice. I took it. I applied something that I already knew. He said, oh, sorry, I, f I forgot to tell you. Uh, one little caveat is when you follow through, make sure you end your weight on your front leg instead of your back leg. thought about it. I didn't really understand, but I tried it, and almost instantly, I was able to hit the ball even harder than I was with greater accuracy. So I was able to apply something I knew from my past, but understand a little caveat to really accelerate where I, where I was. So this talk is for Java engineers that are thinking about getting in a node. Maybe they've read a tutorial, maybe done the Hello World app, uh, but really don't completely understand the world of what makes Node.js up. So I'm going to try to create a valid this for that model by breaking down Node.js and also, to be honest, breaking down the JVM so people can relate the two but really tr try to understand the trade-offs and similarities. And then maybe, just maybe, Node.js developers could stand to learn a little about Java. But that's up to you guys. You know, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> All right. So what this talk isn't, it isn't a language comparison, because that's a whole conference in and of itself, probably full of bike shedding. And the, the bottom line is the languages are radically different, and you're just going to have to learn a new language wholesale. It's not also going to be a comparison of the best of Java versus the best of Node, because there's different camps in each, and there's going to be a wild opinions. I don't have benchmarks. I'm not trying to sell you on one side or the other. I have so much to present tools and mechanisms for a new engineer from Java to have a good mental model of Node.js. All right. So let's first start by answering, where would Node fit into your current enterprise stack? Where would it plug into a current architecture? Well, let's look at the JVM first. We do not necessarily say, or I do not think that Node is a great tool to nuke and pave and replace everything out there. That's just years of investment, not practical at all. But where Node can do is it can complement a, a stack. Here we see a typical JVM application, presentation service, business logic layer with models up and down. If you've already service-oriented architected your stack, it might be a little different and look a little different, but this is more of a, uh, uh, a stack where you are taking requests directly from the clients and making database calls. Still, today, very, very common to see. Spring MVC, very popular framework. I'm just going to continue to use that as an example simply because most people still use that and have a lot of success. So Spring's job is to take requests in the controller, take a model, marry it with a view, and shove the response out the door in the form of HTML. It does that very well. Where Node, though, complements Teams is taking that view out and putting Node as your head ends to, to solve client concerns. 
That way, node stack can take the request from clients, make data-oriented calls, receive data-oriented calls, and then transform those into presentation cliented or in concerns. Okay? Node shines where it takes one request and then maybe makes a par series of calls, paralyzed or, or serial. Uh, paralyzed is, is a lot better, so you can wait at the same time, and we're going to talk through that, and then return out a very client-oriented response. So what are some strengths as Node as your front end, back end? So I kind of breezed through that topic, but I wanted to explain your front end needs a back end. Node can be that because it will solve those client concerns. And I say concerns because in the Java world, we talk a lot about separations of concerns. I love that idea. I've never challenged that as uh, being a great concept, but I actually rather prefer to view, first view a separation across people and a separation across specialties of people so we can divide and conquer better. Have you ever asked a HTML person to run Eclipse just to change the HTML template? You know, you're gonna get some weird looks back, but have you ever asked that same person to run a small little node stack and it's just some HTML in their own little self-contained directory? Much better success. Similarly, if node can be allowed to solve client concerns, you can free up that backend to solve data-oriented concerns, solve model concerns, business log logic concerns, and really divide and conquer a lot better. It will also decouple your development cycles, so Node can iterate at a far greater pace than what data and business logic need to iterate. Product people will always want to roll out new features, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be constantly changing our scheme at the same pace. In fact, you probably shouldn't. It's not, not the greatest idea. So let's look at some common building blocks. Let's just start uh, doing some mental mo modeling. So when you first approach Node, uh, Java engineer is going to find the things on the, on the, uh, under Node, and it's going to say, OK, well, the built-in HTTP module looks a lot like servlet containers, so forth and so on. And so we'll hum everybody's quick to say, this looks kind of like that. The only thing that's clearly different is this uh, event loop thing. But when you actually start looking into each one of these mechanisms, you know, there's, there's some caveats. It looks more like that. So we're going to talk about each one in detail starting now. So let's look at some Java code. So this is a classic vanilla servlet. It's, I'm not showing all the XML that allows us to wire together in the server container spec, but this is mostly the, the Java code to run just a server. It's surprisingly small. It's going to get take a request from the client, make a synchronous request downstream, measure the, the bytes that it gets back, and then respond back up to the client. This is just a contrived example to show the moving parts. So I've got a kind of visualization how things work in the JVM. So let's work through that. So servlets are, are gonna have their own thread pool, something that's very familiar with Java and .NET and a lot of other stacks. Uh, and when a request comes in, it's gonna go through the acceptor thread, and the, a thread from the thread pool is gonna service that. It's going to build up a call stack, and it eventually it's going to make a request and return. But it did that synchronously, and the call stack is going to continue and do some things and return out to the client. Let's look at Node. Uh, this code, smaller, but surprisingly not that much smaller when you compare a vanilla servlet to a vanilla Node server. It does the exact same thing. It makes a request. Uh, it, it receives a request from the client, makes a request downstream, and then shuffles that back up the door. But things look radically different under the hood. So let's start working through that. Here, though, is what Node is inside. Obviously, diagrams, you can draw a million different ways. But for these purposes, I wanted to show that Node is a program that consumes a V8 engine that allows you to run your JavaScript code. Node Core is not just a glue and a pass-through, but it's, it's really the, the core uh, C, C++ and JavaScript that allows you to do evented I.O. where libuv is a standalone program that actually does the evented I.O. Okay? So Node facilitates those, all those actions. And we're going to talk about them more, a little more in detail. So I was able to fit the code along with this working diagram. So we're, we'll just work through that. Request comes in, libuv accepts that request, and it schedules that to be ran in the 
on the main thread in V8. It, a call stack builds up in much in the same way. It goes out the door to make a downstream request. I want the other direction only to show libuv is going to be the mechanism which allows us to do asynchronous I.O., non-blocking. What that means is that call stack is going to return, not waiting for that response, and it's going to go away. So that shouldn't be news, but when you really think about it and talk through Java engineers, uh, it takes a little while to, to remember, wait, there's no call stack? Where to go? How do I continue my program? I, I, I don't understand. So that response is going to come back. What's going to happen is the magic of Node is going to correlate that callback function and then run that within V8. That's going to build up a call stack and respond back to the original request. All right. And that's going to call, that second call stack is going to go away. So the key differences, obviously one versus synchronous and the other asynchronous is one of the things I'd like to point out is the node HTTP module is a lot more low level than server containers. And I actually found this interesting because at the boilerplate from you strip everything down, you have node preferring to not offer a lot of opinions and abstractions to get things done as so much as you use what you need to compose your solution. Whereas in Java, you implement somebody else's abstraction and they'll do some, a lot of heavy lifting to get things done. So I, I found that interesting. I actually find that generally true as you start building up complexity on both of those stacks. So, but let's look at some, some key components that are very similar. In Java, you have the HTTP uh, server request that contains a readable stream. Uh, so you can read things from posts and such. Uh, and in Node, you have incoming requests that is a readable stream. Small little nuance. It's made more apparent on server response, though. Similarly, it contains a writable stream, whereas in Node, it is a writable stream. One thing that I found interesting on these is the more flexibility around the actual stream. You can write either a buffer in Node or a string, and then under hood, of course, it still writes, converts that to a buffer. But it's a little more polymorphic, and in my mind, it's a little usable. Whereas in servlet response, sure, on paper, they're different things. So it makes sense from, a, from the servlet spec to say you either can get and write to the output stream or as a string, one or the other. In Node, you have to call in to close the response, where servlet containers will do that for you. So we've just established the servlet containers do a little more, do a little more lifting. So let's go ahead and bolt in Express on top of vanilla Node. It doesn't actually add a surprising amount of more code. Uh, this does exactly the same thing. A couple things it does add, it adds the ability to add more routes. That way, teams can all of a sudden not step on each other and add key value pairs of route handler URLs to the uh, route URLs to those handlers. Great. Sim and whereas servlet can use, you just add another servlet uh, to do the similar fashion uh, for, for at least vanilla servlets. I know Spring obviously does front controllers. But one thing I want to talk through is it adds the ability to do middleware and cross-cutting concern, and solve cross-cutting concerns. That's actually a facility from Connect, which is an a abstraction that Express uses, or a, a, a module Express uses. So that's nothing new. In fact, I would actually argue that Java World really conceptually nailed that and did that really well. Uh, they do it with filters and some nowadays interceptors, but we're going to just talk through filters. So this fil particular filter will make sure the entire output stream is uppercase. Just a n another contrived example. I just wanted to compare and contrast. So the way it does it, though, is it takes the original response, wraps that in a decorator on the object level. It returns that new wrapped decorated object up the, str up the filter chain. And then because we're in a synchronous environment, the w we can be guaranteed this next third line can do its thing because all the upstream filters and the actual servlet has already finished all of its writing. Here's a Java filter. The key takeaway is what's, what's decorated was an override of git writer. Interesting to note, though, too, is the git writer is returning its own implementation of writer, uh, which is kind of a 
if you think about two levels of deep where you have to wrap the response and then also uh, re uh, return your own print writer. Output. So looking at the node middleware, this is all the code it takes. And the takeaway isn't that node is smaller. I don't actually necessarily say that that's a pro or a con as so much as it's just interesting. One, one fact is, though, node doesn't necessarily require you to wrap and decorate an object. It just gives you the, re the response. And if you want to do something, you, pr you have several options. But this particular implementation that I contrived whipped up is going to do more of a functional decorator. So it's just going to save the function out implement a new function, and when that new function is called, call the old function. To a Javist or people from the JVM world, this is going to feel a little dirty. It's not going to feel exactly right. And I'm not, exact, I'm not standing up here saying this is right or wrong over the Java implementation. It's so much. I wanted to show how much more flexible streams are and how much more flexible the, the language allows you to compose solutions. So, but let's talk about streams. They've actually been a core part of both platforms from day one of each, uh, or very early on from, from each. In Java, though, and this is just a lot my experience, but I've asked every Java person I know, and it's also their experience, programmers will consciously avoid working with output streams. They, a lot of, I don't know exactly why. I didn't like the API. I thought it was terse. But in the day, I only viewed it as a tool and a mechanism to get what I needed done. I did them. I worked with them. But it wasn't, it wasn't interesting in so much as a means to the ends. Whereas a node, a little different. Streams are fun. People take and run with the concept of streams, the flexibility of them, and compose entire abstractions. I've seen flow control libraries built on streams. Not saying that that's what you should or shouldn't do, but people have really loved working in that ecosystem of the flexibility and composability of streams. All right, so let's talk about threads. More importantly, let's talk about the thread. There can be only one main event loop in Node. What that means is Node, while it's processing your JavaScript logic, can only do one thing. And I'm going to explain that again through comparing and contrasting what happens in the JVM when the event of a, a lot of requests come into the system and you can't necessarily get everything done. So let's, let's, take the, let's just start extending that one example. Say there's a downstream service that is accepting your requests that you're making, but for some reason it's going haywire and it's not returning anything, and both sides forgot to put timeouts uh, to time anything out. What's going to happen is your thread pool is going to exhaust itself waiting for a bunch of responses. This acceptor thread is going to get hit a bunch, then the accept count is going to start queuing up all those requests, which is a good thing. Well, unfortunately, there's, a, there's an upper bound of that, and it's actually going to happen that happens at a, a different level within. TCP sometimes, um, but the point is once that's exhausted, you're done. The, there's, there's no more accepting threads, and this is somewhat of a worst case scenario for the JVM. So let's look at what happens with Node. And I want to start by saying Node doesn't fix the problem, but the problem looks radically different. And while we work through this problem, it's, you could say this is maybe a working mental model of how the event loop works, but I'm not going to talk about the loop, event loop, surprisingly. So we're going to make a request. It's going to go through that endpoint to the downstream to the service. It's just going to hold on to everything. So, and that's going to re start returning. But while it's returning, keep in mind, V8 can't do anything else. It's already processing that stack. A request is going to come in through libuv, though. And you can re since we can't do anything, that's going to queue. Technically, this is very similar to acceptor threads. It actually does queue. Uh, the BV pushes it to the system kernel, and it, it allows TCP to queue. And there's several levels of queuing in Node. Again, we're not going to work through the event loop details of multiple queues. But I, I put that right in this box just for, for, for this demonstration purpose. So once that's done, though, cool. So libuv can take that work, give it to V8 to process. It's going to build up that call stack, make that call. And while well, that's returning, maybe you get another request and another one. You just keep adding that to a queue first in, first out. And we can see that first in, first out. Once that is finally done, another one starts to process. And then all of a sudden, we get a bombardment. So we just 
have a bunch of stuff to go through, and I'm going to kind of show how Node will start flushing that through. It's not that difficult. It's a queue first and first out. What's interesting, though, to remember in Node, because you can only do one thing, if one of those guys or one of those threads, call stacks, decides to do a Fibonacci sequence, everything in that queue is going to be is going to suffer. Where we're going to end up, though, is going to end up looking like totally different compared to our JVM counterpart. Because right now, all you have is a bunch of requests downstream where those are being held onto. But Node can actually do that whole thing again and keep accepting requests and keep processing, keep making those requests downstream. So instead of crashing Node, what you're probably going to do is run out of system resources, or each one of these does have memory, so you might actually run out of Node memory. Um, so again, you actually have other problems to worry about, but not the same problem. Uh, all right. So a lot of people will take this example and work through how Node is single-threaded and non-blocking I.O. And they'll say, oh, OK, well, we can do that. Java in I.O. is like Node. Well, kind of, but not really. And then they'll, they'll kind of like work through what Node is, and they'll say, Java in I.O. is more like libuv. OK. Well, you know, that's not completely wrong. But let's, let's work why that is. Um, but it, first and foremost, NIO is a spec that allows you to take a request and handle that and reserve the response on another thread. That's one interpretation and, and use case of NIO. There's also other use cases that deal with files and then specs. And we're going to work through that too. So here is, we're going to switch to Spring MVC, an async uh, handler that will essentially do our same use case, but it's going to use a callable that's going to schedule that work on another thread right here. And it's going to make that call and return. But we're going to do it synchronously, just for the case of seeing what happens. Call, so call stack's going to build up. And instead of making that request there, it's going to make the request on a new thread in a different thread pool. It's going to go out, come back in, and then respond. That didn't really bias a whole lot. You did get the added benefit of your server request pool is uh, returned, so you can keep re accepting requests and shift some problems around. But you're still going to have an upper bound of another thread pool having the burden to do that. And then, by the way, uh, if you implement that example uh, exactly like I showed, that thread pool isn't actually a thread pool. By default, uh, Spring configures that to always be on only one thread. And then it queues beyond that. So. And let, let's extend that. We can do a little better in Java. We can say, let's make an asynchronous call instead of that blocking synchronous call. OK, well, so in this example with Spring MVC, I'm going to create a defer, return that out. I'm going to use an async HTTP client. I, 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 I want him to use async HTTP client, which uses Netty under the hood. And that provides a callback, which will resolve that deferred. So let's look how that looks. That, the call stack builds up. It's going to go ahead and make that request straight into Netty. Netty, I'm not going to talk too much at length, but it, this is considered a black box that f helps you facilitate non-blocking I.O. It's going to take that request and make it on your behalf, and then there's no threads involved. Cool. So we've got some parity right here where there's nothing in the thread pool being, being touched. Once that response comes back, though, it's going to call back into the async HTTP thread pool, if you configure your executor correctly, keep in mind. Build that up and return. All right. So thread pools versus event loops. That's really what this is coming down to. And there's several pros and cons. So first off, when you use a lot of thread pooling and a lot of threads, you just increase your concurrency complexity. This is just something every Java program knows. I'm just kind of stating for, stating for the fact that the more threads you have, the more lock contention you might get if you are trying to access the same memory. Whereas in Node, it favors simplicity of only one uh, call stack one time over vertical scaling. And what I mean by that, Node is simply one process in your system, whereas the JVM is a process with many threads. And so when I say vertical scaling, a, a lot of times you only really deploy one JVM application per machine, and maybe you partition that out. Whereas in Node, you deploy many processes in the same machine to take, take utilize CPU. Because of that, though, Node doesn't share a heap nor does it try. It's another win on simplicity over the dream of sharing a giant heap and having that economy. So Node 
we don't even try to share that. So multiple th pools can compete for CPU. What I really meant by that was multiple threads and multiple pools will compete for multiple CPUs. Because when you take a request and respond through another request and maybe do some stuff on another, you know, uh, another set of threads, you're bouncing that single use case over many threads that could bounce over many CPU cores if the kernel decides to schedule that in a different core. And then if you need to access memory, you're going to be going over the interconnect. Whereas in Node, it's much more fair. You just first in, first out. And when that runs and hits a single CPU, that's going to be highly optimized because you're going to be reusing cache and optimized code will really uh, pair well with the way CPUs really crank through the, the homogenous sets of code. All right. And of course, context switching, it's not free. There's no free lunch in life when it comes to context switching between a lot of threads in the thread pool. But Node, it actually is a little more free. All you're doing is invoking a callback closure, and it's much, much faster. So if you're following along, you could make another uh, observation. Netty, it's kind of like LibbyV. Well, that's actually kind of true. They're both low-level networking libraries, modules, um, where they facilitate non-blocking I.O. However, in I.O. in general, has been around over 10 years. And we haven't seen it really come to predominance in at least the Java mainstream ever, let alone now there's very legitimate projects through Rx, Netty, Ratpack, Vertex. Cool, they all are actually bolted on top of Netty, but they've all gone away from servlet containers because that's a castle that was built a long time ago that just doesn't complement to modern web environments and modern web workflows. Whereas event loops, are a perfect match for that because you're mostly waiting and doing very little work. So the takeaway I want you to see here is the the castles have been built on old foundations. Means to shift into that evented uh, paradigm, it, it, it doesn't necessarily can't necessarily bring older server technology with you. So and that's that's my next point is asynchronous event loop space based programming is a paradigm shift. It's not just a technology. It's not just a mechanism. It's not just you can take a servlet implementation and dial in all your executors into one thread pool, I mean one thread in your, in your pool. It will mind shift into a completely different way of thinking and approaching problems. And the good news is Node programmers approach problems async first. From day one, we were async. From day one, every time you went and asked for something to be done over an IO boundary, you had to wait, and that was OK. And so we built 100,000 modules that all are based on that assumption, a very rich community. All right, lastly, I want to talk a little about try, catch, and call stacks. Because I think this is a perfect opportunity once we're looking at these stacks, how to explain one of the biggest problems that we see in the Node community that Node people have, Java people have, everybody has, they want to handle exceptions. That's something that Java people are great at, but not necessarily great at implementing a node. So let's look at this async example. If I throw here, we're going to get this stack trace. Very long, it's long because it's being handled by the servlet, and it builds up quite a bit of uh, functions. If I throw here, in the callback of the async boundary, you get a short stack trace. OK, well, it's actually not that unreasonable when you Reason about it in terms of threads, throwing here, completely different from throwing here. They're different stack traces because they're on different threads. This make, should make perfect sense to people in the JVM world. But for some reason, when you look at JavaScript code and Node code, that doesn't necessarily translate as obvious. Even to me, I've been doing JavaScript almost my entire career. I, every once in a while, I'll get caught by this. If you throw here versus throwing here, that second throw is on that second callback, uh, on that second stack. So you can't catch anything thrown on that second call stack. Because this try catch right here that we just wrapped around was defined and ran on that first call stack. It's gone, again, completely gone. Whereas when the callback ran, second call stack throw, if, if you don't catch right here really tightly, no one's there to catch you, and in Node, your system will crash, or your process will crash. 
no process refresh, sorry. I'm going to drive this home. Again, if you throw here in your Java counterpart and think caching is going to do anything, define in your other thread or ran in your other thread, nothing's around to catch it. So what can you do? So the, the, this is a whole talk in itself, but the short answer is instead of throwing, simply use the node convention that the community over time solved, which is to bubble up that error up through your error handlers. So in every callback, most of them will participate in this scheme where the first argument is your error. Well, what about things that throw? Well, I'm not saying don't catch. <laughs> There's native JavaScript functions that will throw, such as uh, uh, JSON parsing. So just very contrived right here, though. You can tightly try it, and then if that is if that's going to catch, the only possibility is you just had a problem in your JSON parse and that body really wasn't JSON. So catch it there and convert that into a, uh, a, into a error and call it through your callback. So what are some key takeaways? Well, one, again, Node isn't here to nuke and pave the world. It wants to complement your current in infrastructure. Uh, and it does that really well with solving client concerns. We're building with familiar building blocks, but there's some caveats. So it's important to understand those, but it's more important to flip into the right mental model while doing Node. And that mental model is fully embrace asynchronous event loop based programming that has non-blocking I.O. And then finally, limit throwing to truly exceptional events. So when I say don't throw, I actually meant limit throwing when you mean to crash your Node process. That just means there's nothing you can do. This is the worst case. And yes, that does mean you need to file a ticket and fix it. Uh, whereas if you can recover or you can handle errors, then you need to uh, bubble that up. And that's where we can tie this all together. Java engineers are fabulous about thinking through what needs to happen when things don't go right. Apply that strength. Bring that into Node. I don't see enough Node code that deals with errors properly. It's usually an afterthought to a no thought. Bring that into our ecosystem. Just don't use what's familiar, which is the try catch. Thank you for that for this time, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. So, uh, any discussion about Java versus JavaScript? Well, I really not versus, but when you talk about the two and one, always leads to questions. So, what questions do we have? Right up front there. Would asynchronous programming, it, it, uh, it always expects us to give a callback. Um, but would a uh, programmer of mine still used to synchronous programming where it's sequence of flow? Uh -huh. um, how do you uh, make your code uh, readable when you're doing synchronous progr uh, asynchronous programming? Right. So a lot of people always go to the readability of how callbacks look. For one, no one ever says you have to nest a callback within the way I did. I just did that because that, that's just what everybody's used to. You can simply define your callback up the stack and then pass your function as, your, as a first class, sit, uh, first class object into your callback. So that will unstack it to avoid that like nesting of callbacks. So that, you know, that, that sometimes solves readability. But the, the biggest thing is people, people will always be first to run there and you start talking through it with them and you really actually find out they're just not really truly getting that there's one call stack at any one time and that your callback's gonna be on a different call stack. When the people understand that and are okay with that, somehow they're actually a lot more okay with the fact there are callbacks. And then they really start leveraging callbacks in interesting patterns. So I actually say, first, make sure you're in that mental model and being okay with that. And then address the readability. Hi, uh, Kishore from Mintut. Uh, I, I do Node in Java, so I love yeah. the <laughs> uh, love your squares for LibUV and the V8. We have a um, node calling other dependent systems. I uh, wanted to know how uh, that works. Like, you know, you had all your requests piling up in node, and, you know, eventually V8 is doing some processing. Right. Uh, if, if actually my node process is calling a downstream system, uh, how does that actually work out? Uh, versus in the Java land, you know, you could have triggered parallel requests downstream, and maybe it takes 10 seconds. It's still 10 seconds in a parallel way. 
Right. Whereas a node, does it does it add up or does it multiply? I mean, well, I, I think that's a good question. I'm going to try to answer that. Uh, so if you make ten downstream calls, all in in one little loop, and say I, I got to go ten things, it's going to make those calls not at the same time. Technically, you still got to do it one by one. But what is a better terminology that I always say is you're waiting at the same time. That's where things come in in parallel while you wait. And then you're going to get responses back in different order. There's no guaranteed order. And you're going to have to deal with that. But you know, the, the, I think one of the patterns that the JVM and the enterprise world can help solve in Node is patterns of when those downstreams don't really work out. You know, Netflix has this great Hystrix library that, that was built for the JVM. Nodes is starting to build things like that. There's starting to be talks about circuit breaking, which I'm really excited about. But it's not as mature in the, in the Node world. So I'd actually extend that question and say, uh, or a challenge to say, hey, we really need some more thought leadership on what you need to do if one of those things calls fail or have, s have best practices and patterns on dealing with maybe one of the, you know, a couple of them failing and the rest are okay or, or you know, aborting everything. Yes, I, <coughs> I've been a Java developer for a long time and I'm new to Node. And one of the things I'm struggling with is uh, code completion. Mm. And it's just really driving me batty. So Java is a strongly typed language. Node is a loosely typed language. Right. Um, how, do you, how do you write your Node code? Do you, what editor do you use? Right. And how do you have a useful uh, utilization of code completion? Right. So I, I write my Node code in either Sublime or Vim. I don't have code completion. I miss that from the Java world. I miss something telling me my options, right? But what it's forced me to do is force me to actually read the modules I'm interested in solving my problems. And in Node, we have a concept born out of the Unix world, do one thing and one thing world. So it doesn't take me that long to read it. And things are usually on GitHub. And so in, in, in my opinion, GitHub for Node is the man pages of yesterday, right? And so reading documentation, really quickly will allow you to uh, understand what, what you're using. It's going to take longer, but the only thing I can tell you is when you do it, you will build things faster in Node. It doesn't sound like you will, but you will. <laughs> you just got to try it. And I'm not saying everybody's going to like it, but almost everybody will say, I've built this thing, and it took me a shorter amount of time, even though I had to go find my modules and read things. Yeah, there's there's IDEs that do that. I, I you know, but I don't I don't use it. I just either read things and then um, do it. Yet another Java developer here. One other thing I miss, for, you know, when I'm writing Node code, is being able to debug, stepping through the code, yeah. looking at the variables. So, what are your recommendations? Do you have any? That, that's a tools? that's a great question. So I always am a huge fan of debuggers. From day one of my Node journey, when I first picked it up, there's this tool called Node Inspector. That generally has worked. Uh, there was a time period where it went a little dark, but it's it's back and it works really well. It allows you to attach a actually a debugger that is built into Chrome to a node process. Pause, step through, see variables. It's great. <laughs> WebStorm and Visual Studio. <laughs> Visual Studio has a great integrated debugger. We plus one for WebStorm. Sure. Yeah, Visual Studio works great. Yeah. Since uh, JavaScript is single-threaded, um, how does it uh, take advantage of multi-core environment? That's a really good question. So again, Node is a single process. And the fact of the matter is operation teams love Node because they're able to reason about what you just dropped off to their operation a lot better. Single process, it takes a request, it has resource requirements, but you can measure that and reason about it in just one thing. And then if you have multiple cores, you could just, as an operations person, well, I can launch three or eight processes, all maybe on a different port. You could use cluster. But you're able to actually scale node vertically on one machine a lot more predictably than, say, the JVM with a lot less effort. Again, one thing I didn't really mention is all that JVM stuff we work through, every single thing has a little dial, which is cool on paper. But the reality is, have you ever tried to communicate all these little dials to an operations person that just wants to get things up and running efficiently that might have a difference of opinion than what you developed? So, so uh, Stephen Loomis, IBM. So I'm, I'm getting the, the single-threaded model 
in Node, and that's that's cool. That I, I see I see how that is an advantage. But it seems like that makes the um, clustering and sort of orchestration among processes more important. Is that something that is a um, that is ripe for emerging standards among applications, or yeah. is that the great thing about standards? Y yeah. So you know, you know, the first comment on, on that last is Node doesn't have a lot of standards right now, and I think that's one of the shining beacons that's allowed it to iterate so quickly. Uh, but for your comment of synchronization, if it, a lot of big stacks, a lot of enterprise stacks are already uh, taking traffic in dozens, hundreds of machines, right? If you launch 10 processes on a machine, technically you still have to deal with that horizontal scaling. So you still have to solve your horizontal scaling process problem. So whatever you're solving for that, you can just apply on uh, one machine. Does that, can, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, on the high level. Hi, I'm William. I'm uh, from the Java developer side. So on Java, we focus on uh, thread pool, try to make sure that you guarantee response time as quick as possible to any kind of request. Mm. But on the node side, now you are stuck with this uh, single execu execution. How are you going to guarantee one of the requests stuck, you know, bring right. down the whole response time. I love that question. And I love it because, sure, we're all accountable to the programs we write. And if there's an SLA, there's SLA. But the proof is always in the pudding, in my opinion. And the reality is when you take a web, uh, a set of web requests that are going to wait on non-blocking I.O., a single event loop does, is very, very efficient. And I would actually just, suggest try it out and measure it. And if, if you meet the SLA, that's great. If you don't, well then you, you're not meeting the SLA. There's, there's no guarantee built into the language, the function, the, the standards, right? But if uh, we're seeing Node has no problem meeting previous SLAs from previous stacks. Thank you. Um, do you see things that are coming in the future of JavaScript, like new language features in ES6 and ES7, um, as being able to help the things like dealing with errors and understanding code for someone who comes from like a Java background? Uh, at all? Well, you know, promises have the promise of that. Um, I think a lot of people would probably champion that promises could help out with that. I came from a very heavy promise shop from my last company, obviously not ES6 promises, which is, is different as user land promises. Uh, and the reality is I wrote just as many code, bad co just as much bad code as using callbacks. You know, I don't necessarily feel a, a feature in the language is gonna help you shift into the fact you have multiple call stacks, but they execute one at a time. And I think that's the core problem, is that mental model, rather than necessarily a deficiency in the language. That's just my opinion. Uh, I think time will tell. Uh, promises are being uh, enabled by default in Chrome very soon, and perhaps Node. Yeah, I, sorry, I, I more meant generators and promises. Yeah, sorry, generators. Yes, generators is what I was talking about. My bad. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you.